Hey, good morning, Avenue Church. How you guys doing today? Yeah, wow, right, yeah. All right, hopefully that'll get better. Hopefully that'll get better. Hey, so you know, we're, we're starting Advent early. You, you heard we got some Christmas stuff going on. We love Christmas here. Um, last week, I kind of said, hey, this is going to be the, the preview week of our Advent series uh, because we're starting early. We love all things Christmas. And you remember I had a little exchange uh, between my wife and I where she's kind of like on the initiative to save Thanksgiving. I don't know if you remember that or not. And, and the kids and I, we're, we're like, man, it's Christmas time after October. Whatever, whenever Halloween's done, we begin and start, start to celebrate Christmas. And, and so, you know, we have this kind of thing going on in my house, but I think I may have overdone it. I think I, like, overcooked it because here's what happened yesterday. This is how you know you overdid it. Um, Notre Dame game's on last night, okay? Notre Dame's playing USC, and, and we, we love sports and all, all, all things sports in my house, and so we're watching college football. It's Saturday night. It's like that. And my wife goes up to bed a little bit early than I do, and, and she is a Notre Dame fan. I'm not necessarily a Notre Dame fan, but I'm married to her, and so we watch you know, Notre Dame games frequently. Anyways, it's a close game, right? Like at halftime, Notre Dame's down by three, and it's into the third quarter, and she goes upstairs, and so I go up not too long after her. And when I, I come into the room and she's still awake and the TV's on, so what am I expecting to see on? Notre Dame USC, like heading into the fourth quarter. It's going to be this epic finish, right? And that would be very normal for us. And here's where I think I overdid it with my wife because I did not see Notre Dame USC. Rather, what I saw was the Hallmark Channel on. And... As you can imagine, there was some romance happening on the Hallmark Channel. There were all the ingredients of a good Hallmark Christmas movie. Um, there was an ice skater, because it's like, you know, you're going you're gonna to have some, some sort of like ice skater involved somewhere along the line. There was um, English nobility. There was a single guy. There was a young girl. And there was a chance that these two people might get together. Uh, I walked in the room, and, and my wife said something like, yes, it's as cheesy as it sounds. And um, she figured out what was going to happen in the first 10 minutes of watching it. But it was still on, and I knew I must have overdone it when you trade Notre Dame football for the Hallmark Channel on a Saturday night. So I, I did learn that there is a, a potential of overdoing this early Advent thing, but, but we're... We're, we're not going to overdo it here today. We're going to be right where we need to be. We're, we're glad you're here. My name's Casey. I get to serve as one of the pastors at the Avenue Church, and we are starting our Advent series early because Advent actually kicks off uh, next Sunday, but I wanted to give you a preview for kind of like what is Advent and wh where should your heart be as it pertains uh, to, to the Advent season. So let's Let's do a little like kind of background material. Advent, uh, what does the word mean? The word is, it, it's, it can be translated into Greek as parousia, and it means coming. It means coming, and, and it's a season where you, for like four weeks, for where you look back to Jesus breaking into humanity at, you know, we celebrate that obviously as Christmas, but, but it's a time for us to look back at the first time when, when God broke in, in that, in that capacity. And then it's also a time to think about his second coming. And so it finds us in this in-between state where we're looking back and we're incredibly thankful that God broke into humanity so that we might break into his realm for eternity. We're incredibly thankful for that. But we're also thankful that the good news of the gospel is not just a historic event, it's also a future event that is yet to come. There's both history to the gospel, there, there's future to the gospel, and when you find yourself doing backwards and forwards looking, it actually changes today, because there's a lot of reality to the gospel in the present moment. Um, just another piece of history, there was this council uh, in 383 AD called Sargosa. And at the Council of Sargosa, um, there was, the, it, it's not the beginning of Advent because uh, I was uh, working with the, the pastor from Trinity. We're doing this series together and, um, and he, he did a little homework on, on where Advent began and things like that. And there's no official beginning of Advent, but in, in 383 AD, so just, you know, a couple hundred years after the death uh, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's a council, and at this council, they, they didn't start Advent, but what they did is they doubled down on the fact that God broke into humanity 
uh, in, in human form through Jesus. And it became like, man, this is going to be a defining principle of Christian belief, that God became flesh. And uh, obviously, that's, that's a huge part of Advent. So we know that it's been around for uh, a ton of years. We're excited to celebrate it because it's not just Christmas like lights and Hallmark movies. There's actually some, um, what we think is incredible significance that's going to happen when you start to expect uh, Jesus in, in a really meaningful way. So I'm going to pray, and, uh, and we're going to kind of hop into uh, this idea of, of what it means to expect Jesus. Father, we ask that you would uh, fill us with your spirit, Lord, that you would be among us in a really uh, special way today. We're just depending on you. That's what we're going to do, Lord. We're going we're gonna to bet it on you, Father. We're going to bet it on your spirit, and we're going to say, hey, if, if your spirit shows up and dwells among us and does a work within us, it's going to be a really beautiful, healing, life-transformative day. And so that's what we're asking for, Father, from you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Awesome. Amen. So I um, wanted to kind of like just begin our time with this idea of waiting, waiting. Uh, if, you, if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in a couple of places if you want to mark them. Um, one of the places is going to be Psalm 27, and one of the places is going to be 1 Corinthians. We'll get there in just a second. But um, this idea of waiting, because Advent is about waiting, because if somebody's coming, then that means you're waiting on them. And I thought, man, that's probably not really our sweet spot, right? Like, most of us don't usually show up to an event, and we're like, oh my goodness, that's amazing, look at the line. We <laughs> get we get, to, we get to hang out here for like 45 minutes. It's going to be awesome. Many of you, when you're driving in traffic, you're usually not incredibly psyched to hop on to 95 because you forgot to look at your maps and you didn't, you didn't see the all red. And now you're like, oh, I'm stuck. Most of you aren't like, oh, this is going to be an amazing prayer time for me. It's going to be an extra 30 minutes, but it's going to be great. It's going to be a great way for me to connect with the Lord. Most of us... When it comes to like our electronics, your best side doesn't usually come out when you have to wait on your electronics. I mean, if, if you just kind of like look back at your last maybe three, four weeks, anytime you had to wait on a device that you can hold or you can look at for more than maybe like three seconds, you're like, oh, this thing is so slow, man. We gotta hit the Apple Store. Black Friday's coming up. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna we have to upgrade if we have. To wait. I know if you're like me, I feel like I'm kind of a patient person. Like, I do patience okay. I have some people in my house that help me exercise that, which is awesome. Thankful for that. But um, when, when I drive, again, I'm not an angry driver. I just can't stand to stand still. So I might be out at 441, like way west. I could be on the turnpike, and if there's a delay, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to beat this thing with A1A. <laughs> and I'll like drive all the way over here just to crawl this way. Meanwhile, my wife, who's always like, just wait. Just wait. This is our best route. Just wait. She's usually at the event. She's eating and she's waiting on me. And I'm like, A1A, but the view is beautiful, babe. Like, <laughs> it was, I just can't stand to like stand still for very long. <laughs> I mean, that might be a shock for you if you've been at this church in a while, right? But it's like the thought of me not advancing, not moving, man, it just, it's like it grinds at me. It's like kind of a, it's kind of like a pet peeve. I don't have a lot of pet peeves. Just, this is random, has nothing to do with the sermon, just so you know. Kid bop is one of them. And waiting in line when I'm behind the wheel is another. I've just got to find a different way. So, so the scriptures talk about waiting um, a lot. There's actually 85 places where the word wait is mentioned um, in the ESV. And uh, we're going to be in a psalm today that, that takes a look at this idea of waiting. It's Psalm 27. Um, and, and I wanted to just define for you uh, the idea of, of waiting. It comes from this word called kava, actually interesting word, but that's how it's, how it's pronounced. And it means to, um, to like look for, to, to hope for. To, to have an expectation of. I love what um, David uh, Guzik says. David Guzik was a guy who preached here a couple weeks ago, and uh, we, I use his commentary frequently. It's called Enduring Word. And um, Check out this quote by David. I think we have the quote. Uh, he says this about waiting on God. The idea behind wait on the Lord is not a passive sitting around until the Lord does something. Yes, God gives us strength, but we don't expect it to come as if he were pouring it into us as we sit passively. All right, I like that. He brings it to us as we seek him 
and rely on him instead of our own strength. That's awesome. I love that. So here, let me just kind of give you the message if you got to get out of here early, and then we'll, we'll break it down a little bit. But it's, it kind of goes like this. When you hear waiting on the Lord, what that doesn't mean is that, like, if I'm struggling in the midst of an addiction or I've got this thing in my life that I would love to see change or I have a career that I feel like God's called me to or I've got young kids that the idea of waiting on the Lord is just waking up and sitting and thinking that God's going to do something for me as I just sit and wait on him. Whether I have a problem or an opportunity, waiting on the Lord is not passive. It is not just like, all right, God, it's time for you to show up. It's going to be awesome when you take care of this thing that I've got kind of like owning my life right now. No, no, no. Waiting on the Lord means I am actively giving the best of myself to doing the next right thing as I trust him to empower me for that next right thing. It's taking one step, followed by another step, followed by another step, depending on his strength to give me the next step. But it is one step after the other with my heart and my hands and my head focused on Jesus and the situation at hand. It's a dual activity. It is not passive. So if we go back to those those, those three kind of verbs uh, as it defines, yeah, there it is, as it defines to wait. So we're going to look at kind of the, the Hebrew idea in the Old Testament of waiting, and then we're going to look at the, the Greek idea in the New Testament because there's a difference, and then we're going to make some practical application for us today. So, so back in the Hebrew, this is kind of when David writes, he, he wrote a lot of the Psalms, King David, and um, so King David, just so you know, is, is uh, familiar with, with being in some challenging situations. I like to hear from people who have some scars. Okay, if, if you're not bloodied and you're not bruised and you don't have some failure attached to you, you probably don't have a ton to say to me. Like, I want to hear from somebody who's been through it and hasn't, like, succeeded 100% and yet is still experiencing the faithfulness of God. Now, you have my attention. So here's, here's a guy, he uses this word frequently in his psalms, it's, it's a pretty regular word for him, and it's got these, these um, nuances to it, it means to look for. What's cool about looking for something is that means you have to actually take your eyes off yourself. I can't look for you like this. Where's your kids? I don't know. Where's your wife? I don't know. Where's that person that you were supposed to meet? I don't know. You, you can't look for someone else while you're hyper-focused on you. I love that an invitation to lift my eyes. Hope. This is not a hope with my fingers crossed, like, man, I hope God comes through today. It is a rising confidence saying, I know it's going to happen. I just don't know when or how. Expect. This is where we're going to hopefully leave you with today. Man, I hope today really encourages you. I hope you leave here with encouragement. And one of the ways that I can encourage you is to grow your expectation muscles. I don't think we expect enough from Jesus. I want to break that down and explain that, and you know, not, I'm not going this way or that. But I, I think that there's, there's a real sense where we understand some things about Jesus, but we don't expect Jesus to show up as he promises to. We're going to work through that. Let's, let's look at Psalm 27. Again, it comes from David, and um, as, as, we, as we open our Bibles there, there's a verse that we're going to camp out on. It's verse uh, four, 14, but before we get there, Psalm 27, um, we don't exactly know when in David's life this was written. We just know that it was written in a point where he still had some enemies. He still had some issue going on in his life. So there's different periods in David's life where things are good, where things are bad, where things are easy, and where things are difficult. Okay, he's got different seasons. I feel like that's like a day for me. I don't know if anybody can relate to that. Sometimes like my morning, man, my morning was awesome, like super faithful, totally focused. My afternoon, kind of a mess, would rather forget about it. And then, and then in the evening, it just got hard. I, w I was focused, but it just was like an uphill battle. So David's life is, is sometimes like a day for us. And that's why I love David, because he can, he's a guy, he's like one of my best friends in the scripture. You should have a best friend in the scripture. All right, Jesus is the hero, we know that. But you should have like a, like a BFF in the scripture that's like, that's my guy, that's my girl. 
they get me. David, he's like, he's like my BFF in the scripture. He gets me. And, and he writes from this place where things aren't great. If, if you have your Bibles, you can just kind of look. I'm going to glance at a few verses here. If not, you have to, you have to read Psalm 27 this week. You, like, have to. He, he starts off by saying this. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? What's cool about David is he was a smack talker. There's something about people who are smack talkers where it's like, okay, if they, if they talk a bunch of smack, okay, you know, like last Last week I talked about Creed 2. I saw Creed 2. It was awesome, full of smack talk, full of all these things that I like wanted, right? There's, I'm crying, I'm chilling. So there's all these emotions that are happening for me in Creed 2. But one of the things that goes on in a boxing movie, especially like that, is there's a ton of smack talk. Now it's one thing for you to talk smack and, and like you can't back it up. It's another thing for people who talk smack and then are able to like back it up. I love this about David because he was humble, but he was able to be confident at the same time. He talks smack about his fear, about his enemies, about those who might come and oppress him. And this is how he starts. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Like, what, do you, what could you possibly do to me if the Lord is for me and with me? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? For those of you who struggle with fear, anxiety, even depression, listen, I want to invite you today to talk a little smack to your fear, to talk a little smack into your depression, to talk a little smack into those enemies that rise up from the inside and they, they call your name, they know how to own you for years, even if that might feel awkward or weird for you, man, just go ahead and step out there and be like, you know what, I'm going to talk a little smack, like I don't need to be afraid of you, you don't need to own me, I'm no longer going to follow your lead, anymore. what can you do to me because of who Jesus promises to be in the life of his people? When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. I love this next verse. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. That doesn't, look, stay with me here. It doesn't mean that David doesn't feel fear. We know from other Psalms that David is very familiar with the feeling of sinking and dying in my bones like I just want to end it. If you are a person who's ever got to that point where you're like, it's just easier to not be here, David's your guy. It doesn't mean he doesn't feel the fear. It just means it's not going to own him. It's a choice. My heart shall not fear. I won't lean into my feelings because I know my feelings are a lie if my God is the light of my salvation. I'm not going to be led by what I shouldn't be led by. The war arise against me, yet I will be confident. It's not the absence of war. It's not the absence of conflict. It's not the absence of the battle that David's looking for. He's just looking for a strength outside himself that he can finally be confident enough in to talk smack and actually see that strength show up. Because probably like David and like me and like you, you've tried a ton of other strengths beside the Lord that never really lasts. David goes on in, in a couple other places to just talk about like his confidence in the Lord and, his, and just his, his connection with the Lord and how he wants to abide with the Lord and how if he can just be in the presence of God, that will be enough. If he can just be in the presence of God, that will be enough because he knows something about the presence that's more powerful than his current situation no matter what his current situation is. And then he ends it with like the culmination. Let's throw that verse up on the slide. He ends it with, this is, this is how I can do this. Wait for the Lord. Look for, hope for, expect the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Listen, this is not something you're born with. You're not born strong. You're not born courageous. This is a decision of God's people to either walk in this promise that is rightfully theirs or not to. So David is inviting us to trust God, to wait on, to expect God, and then as a ramification of that, in, a long, in agreement with that, to be strong and let your heart take courage. And then he says it again, wait on the Lord. I love that because you know what Advent, you know who Advent's for? 
Advent is for the weak and fearful. If you're not familiar with weakness and you're not familiar with fear, Advent's just going to be, like, annoying to you. You're going to be like, all right, I got to set up some light, you know, this and that. And this, the whole, even the whole Christmas, it's just going to be like, all right, you know, I kind of got to get through it. There's, there's so many things I have to do along the way. And, you know, it's just going to be kind of another thing to survive. Why do you think I love Advent so much? Those of you who know me will say, because you, Casey, are one who deals with weakness and fearness. That's not a word. I'm going to start that again. You, Casey, are one who deals with weakness and fear, like all the time. You're very familiar with your weakness. You're very familiar with your fear. So I love that there's a season that reminds me to lift my eyes off this guy and say there's a strength outside of me that I can be confident in. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take courage. Wait. Look for hope for, lift your eyes and begin to expect in new ways the Lord. That's where David was coming from. And David had some enemies that would certainly necessitate that sort of thing. David was weak. David was fearful. He allows me to be weak and fearful so that I might actually be strong and courageous in someone else. If that's you, man, Advent's going to be for you. Advent is going to be for you. But there's a New Testament side of waiting as well that we want to look at. There's the First Corinthians side of waiting. Um, again, if you have your Bibles, this comes from Paul. Now, now, Paul was one who was another guy who was familiar with weakness and failure and, and fear. Um, if you know Paul's story, it didn't start off good, you know, it was, he was not somebody who you would have said came through like Avenue Kids program and just continued to excel in the knowledge of the Lord. He did not have a good start. It was pretty bad. Don't have time to go into the details of it, but it was, uh, it was certainly one that God had to, to enter in and, and do some serious redemption work through. And so Paul, in the midst of that redemption work, man, he, he, he meets Christ and he starts writing letters to these different churches that he's helped to start, that he's helped to plant. We're, if you're new here, we're, we're a church that was started eight years ago. So we would have been like one of the churches that Paul may have started and he would write a letter, you know, to the church in Delray. And, and it might have said something like it said to the church in Corinth. And, and in, in 1 Corinthians, beginning in chapter 1, he writes to this church. Now this church got a lot of problems, got a lot of issues. Um, but this is, this is how he starts off writing. It's like he's giving them a foundation upon which to stand so that they might grow in the midst of their messiness. I love that about Paul. And I love that about the church in Corinth. It was not the perfect church. And yet this is what Paul has to say to them, beginning in verse 4. I give thanks to my God uh, always for you because of the grace of God that was given to you in Christ Jesus. And so he's saying, hey, man, like I'm super thankful that you guys are in Christ Jesus. We're going to talk about that in a second. Skip down a few verses to verse 5. So that you are not lacking in any gift as you wait. There's that word again. means a little bit different. For the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will sustain you to the end. Who will sustain you to the end. Who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so it, it's, it has a lot of sort of the same meaning, the idea that you're, you're, you're looking and you're waiting and things like that. But the thing about Old Testament waiting, especially when it was with David, is that it was, for the, it was like for the moment. David needed God to show up in the moment. And the waiting in the New Testament that you see a lot is talking about waiting for what's to come. Now, there's, there's momentary waiting, and there's momentary ways where God shows up and is, is, like, radically awesome. But New Testament waiting not only lifts your eyes to a source outside yourself, it lifts your eyes to a source outside yourself that is coming in the future. Here's the, here's the deal about the New Testament that I think we've sometime lost, and, it's, and it's, it's surrounding the word gospel. Now, when you think of gospel, you might think of there's, that's good news because that means you can be forgiven of your sin, and that's true. 
See, it's a, it's a military word, right? And it means that like there's been a victory won on your behalf so, so you can be excited about that. You didn't fight a war that was coming your way, but there's been a victory that goes towards your name. Had the war come towards you, you would lose. That's what the cross of Jesus is all about. He went to a cross and he took your sin and mine. And, and, and the, the wrath of a holy and just God was poured out on Jesus because it should have gone to me. It should have gone to you. That's the war we would lose time and time again when, if we were to stand before a holy God and say, here I am, this is my best intentions. We'd lose that war for eternity over and over. Jesus is like, no, 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 I'm going to fight that war for them. So before the war comes to us, it comes to him. And he's crushed in our place. He overcomes our sin and death through his resurrection and he says, you can now receive this victory by faith. Like, you can quit trying. You can, you can quit, quit trying to think your goodness or your church attendance or your generosity is going to, you know, measure up. Listen, go ahead, quit on your self-salvation efforts and believe that what I've done for you is enough. Receive it by faith and follow me. That's what it means to turn from ourself and trust in Jesus. That we would trust him here, that we would trust him here, and that we would trust him with our hands. That we would believe his finished work is enough, so much so that we would quit on ourselves and begin in him. That is what faith and repentance is. There is a victory that goes to those who receive Christ that way. It's the victory of forgiveness. The gospel is about forgiveness, comma, but the sentence doesn't end there. See, in the New Testament, they understood forgiveness. They understood that there was this priest that used to make a sacrifice for people's sins, and now Jesus was the priest, but he was also the sacrifice. And just like in the Old Testament, the, the animal dies so that the people could go free, Jesus died so that you and I can now go free. They got forgiveness. They got that they no longer needed to live in shame and guilt, and, and, and they were able to lean into the good news of forgiveness, but there was this other element of the gospel that was so amazing, and it captured the New Testament audience. Paul writes about it here, and he says, as you wait for the revealing of Christ Jesus, there was, watch this, there was this idea that like, like Jesus was on the edge of coming back. And the gospel was that I was forgiven, that I was reconnected to God through faith, but that there was a day coming when Jesus was going to come back, and when he came back, he was going to renew all things. Like his resurrection wasn't just about the fact that I get to be forgiven. It was about the fact that there's renewal coming for both me and all of creation, and it's going to come soon. They lived um, engaged in their day-to-day -day stuff, but also with like, oh, is that it? Oh, is that? So much so that in another place, Paul has to write about like, well, listen, don't get consumed with thinking you're going to read the signs and guess when Jesus is coming back. Live your life, give yourself fully to the moment, but never forget that we are on the brink of renewal. Jesus is coming. And the gospel to them was both for the now, like I'm forgiven, I'm free, I can start to live a new way, but it was also for the then. It was also like, man, I can endure this brokenness because I know it's just for a moment. And I know there's a day when my Jesus is coming back, and when he comes back, it's on. It's on like I've never imagined it before. So this is momentary. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it well, but I'm going to know that in that day, I'm waiting for him to come and renew all things. I feel like we've lost that. I feel like we get the gospel for today, but not the gospel for tomorrow. I, and maybe, maybe this is just my own experience, but I feel like we're so consumed with the here and now and what we're working through and, and how Jesus is doing this and doing that in the here and now, which is really, really good stuff, that there's times when we've forgotten to lift our heads and realize, hey, no matter what Jesus accomplishes here, he is going to finish the good work he started in that day. He's coming back, so wait for it. Quit living like he's not coming home again.
Waiting seems to be like what we do. Have you ever thought of that? Like, what does a Christian do? A lot of different things a Christian does, and, you know, I'm not here to make a huge theological point on the fact that, like, this is the only thing we do. But, like, any, any person who follows Jesus today, like, uh, one of your main things is waiting, well, you could say it's love, and you could say it's serving, and you could say it's adoption, and you could say it's giving, and you could say it's evangelism. All those things are true. Those are things that we do. But check this out. If they don't come out of a heart that's trusting Jesus, then they're going to be short-lived and, and somewhat powerless. You see, when you start to wrap your mind around the fact that waiting is what we do, Man, things start to change. You know, people ask Jesus, hey, what what is it to do the work of God? You know what he told them? Believe. Believe. Wait. Get your heart in a posture that is trusting, that is looking, that is expecting me, and then live your life out of that posture. Waiting is what we do. So the question I have for us is, is there a way for us? Can we get better? I'm, that's me, man. I am always like, all right, I got it. Wait on the Lord. Be courageous. Wait for his second coming. I got it. But how, how can I get better at that, man? Like if I'm going to grind at something, I want to grind at the right thing. So if, if waiting is what I do, how can I wait better? Here's some of the stuff that, that we kind of work through when I say we, just like Jesus and myself and just kind of like the course of life this week. So check it out. A few, a few things that will hopefully encourage you guys as you wait along the way. Call it the art of waiting. Um, first one is location. Location. Location is a must. Like, we have to know where we are as, as it pertains to waiting. We have to have a, a really clear um, perspective on where we are, or we're going to get confused and frustrated and upset. So this, this happened to me uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, I've, you know, I have, I have a couple of kids, and uh, we, I have a two-year-old and a three-year-old, and one of the prevailing questions for us with our two- and three-year-old is, what are we going to do? <laughs> you, there's only so many things you can do with two little kids at a at, at time and then and a somewhat limited budget, right? So it's like almost literally every day when we have them, it's like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Where are we going to go? You know, like, how are we going to, um, I don't want to, this is going to sound crude, but how are we going to, thrive till bedtime. Let's just put it like that. <laughs> so if bedtime's at seven and it's two, it's like, what are we, we, cause you can't just show up at people's house. You can't just show up in public. You just, you kind of have to map out what you're going to do. So one of the things that we decided to do, because we used to drive by this place all the time, is we saw the new CVS on military and Atlantic being built from ground up. We saw, and, and every time on their way to school, back in the spec, when they went to school over out west, they'd be like, workers, there's workers. And so there was this promise that when the building was done, we were going to go in it because that would be something we could do. It's free-ish. I mean, we're going to, you know, there's going to be something that happens inside there. But it's like, it's, they can look forward to it. I don't think many people are going to be hurt. Um, it's going to be like this safe thing that we can do that's local, and it's just going to be awesome. And so the building was built, and so my kids being like, um, great rememberers were like, hey, we, like the building, let's do the building. When are we going to go to the building? And it's like, th it was a really big deal to go to the brand new CVS. And so one day I took my son because I realized that, you know, you don't, you don't try these things too much on your own, okay? You, you usually bring, you bring support, you bring a wingman. So I brought my 13-year-old and he and I were going to let the kids go into the CVS. And so we entered in the CVS and, um, it was, it was really awesome because you can see a Christmas tree and you can see a Santa when you walk in. So it was amazing. So they started roaming around the CVS and I was like, yes, this is awesome. And um, before I knew it, we, I, like I was, I, there was at least one point where I'm not sure if I, I went into a run, but there was definitely like a hustle and I was, I was guiding one of my children back this way and Cole had the other one and it, they were all over the place. It was like Disney World for a two and three year old. And they saw these these shimmery things. And one of the things that we did was we pushed buttons on those animated things that sing 
Christmas songs. And so we had Rudolph going, and, you know, he would, like, shuffle, and then he'd sing the song. My kids were like, yes, that was awesome. But meanwhile, they had pushed this other one, and it was just becoming really, really chaotic. So I'm like, look, we, we've got to go. Like, <laughs> we've, I forgot how quiet CVS is compared to Target. So, like, if this goes down in Target, it's just like, whatever. But in CVS, two things. It's quiet, and there's older people that go to CVS. And, and it's totally cool. Like, I love older people. I'm related to them. But they don't always, they don't always have a high appreciation for, like, a ton of machines happening at the same time. And so I was like, all right, we got to go, and we're going to do the candy because I want this to be a memorable moment. So we got the candy, and then my one son, he, he doesn't understand, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, where you get too close to somebody, personal space. So he's, like, running right in front, getting his candy, and I'm, and I'm trying to just manage this while it's like, you know, you know how you, like, you're trying to smile to see if they're okay with this? and not, <laughs> so I'm like, dude, we just got to exit right, scene right, let's go. So we paid for it. Here's what I realized. I forgot how hard it was going to be. Like, I had this idea in my mind that it was going to look like this, but I just kind of forgot where I was. And I forgot how hard it was going to be. And because of that, like, I felt things rising up in me that probably didn't need to be there. I think some of us, myself included, we forget how hard it's going to be here. Like, we forget that it's not the new world yet, that Jesus hasn't come back, that we're still on the edge waiting. And cancer and depression and divorce and addiction and all these things still exist. And sometimes it's just really helpful to be reminded that it's not time for all that stuff to be done away with yet. Like, it doesn't make it okay. It just helps you to understand that it's still part of our reality until that day. And it actually does this lifting of your eyes that you can't do if you pretend like it doesn't hurt. It's probably harder than you thought it was going to be this week because maybe you forgot is you were in your own little CVS. <laughs> and it's not working out like you planned. I heard a speaker once say, in the garden, every day was a 10. Ever since the garden, every day's been a five. And we keep hoping for the 10. We live in a broken, sinful, self-absorbed world that Jesus has not yet fully redeemed. It's okay to hurt it's okay that it's hard. It's okay because it reminds us that he's coming to give us something better. Just don't forget where you are. Second thing was uh, expectation. Man, I think expectation, uh, it's, a, it's a must here. Um, and I said this earlier. It seems like this is true of me. I understand different things about Jesus that I don't expect him to actually fulfill. Isn't that weird? It's kind of odd, right? That, like, I understand that um, I don't, like, I understand that if I, if I, if I come to Jesus, he's going to give me rest. He makes that promise, right? Are you familiar with that promise? Come unto me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That's a promise from Jesus. I totally understand it. I can teach you what it means. I just don't, like, expect it to happen for me. It's weird, right? Like, it, it seems as though I understand certain things that I don't then expect from Jesus. And that's not just like a weird thing. I feel like to a degree that's insulting to Jesus. Are you with me? Yeah. Like, so, so if you understood certain things about, like, your mom or your dad, but then every night you were wondering, like, I understand that they're kind and generous and faithful, but, man, I just don't know where dinner's coming from tonight. Like, I don't know if I can go, I don't know if I can sleep in my bed. I mean, I'm 12, you know, they've been talking about getting a job. And, like, if you treated people that you understood certain things about with those kind of expectations, I feel like they would be hurt. And it seems as though Advent is an awesome time to raise our expectations 
to match what we understand about Jesus. And so as I thinking about sort of expectations, there's this idea um, that it, John Piper writes a book called Future Grace. And it, and it has this twofold idea where um, grace is something that has happened in Christ, like Jesus fought your battle for you, so you, you got lavishly what you didn't deserve. But then there's this idea of future grace where you're going to um, have grace show up before you show up in the moment. Like, it's, it's going to be there when you need it, I should say. And then, of course, there's, there's future, future grace, which is Jesus coming back again. But I want to talk to you about the, about the future grace that's, that's kind of um, two steps ahead of you. So when I start talking about expecting Jesus this Advent season, here's, here's what I mean. Um, maybe, maybe you have a difficult thing that's happening this particular next few weeks. Maybe it's a, a, a relationship that's really, really difficult. Maybe, maybe it's, you know, you're walking through the holiday season and this has always been a time of failure for you, epic failure. Whatever your failure is, it usually happens now. Maybe this is a time where you're going to, you know, you're going to be lonely and you're going to be reminded again how, like, you're single and everybody who's married with kids really enjoys the holidays, but you don't and, and like, you miss out on something. I don't know what it's going to be. Like, like, those are real, real things. Here's how future grace works. This is what it means to expect Jesus. Future grace says this, that as you, as you show up into those situations, it's okay to expect Jesus to be completely enough before you feel it the week before. As you think about Christmas Eve, as you think about that difficult situation, as you think about later today, and you're like, man, I'm kind of worried, I'm kind of stressed, I'm kinda, I don't know. Like, Here's what it means to wait on Jesus. Here's what it means to expect Jesus, that I'm going to show up and I'm going to start to lean into the fact that Jesus is going to give me, because of his grace, everything I could need and more to thrive in that particular moment. It might hurt, it might be difficult, it might, it might sting, but future grace says that you're going to have what you need, you just need to keep showing up and expecting Jesus to be Jesus. So I want to invite you this Advent season to go ahead and talk a little smack and think a bit more confidently that Jesus will actually give you, according to his promises, what you need when you need it. Because the other thing about expecting Jesus is that oftentimes you don't get what you need until you need it. You know when the, in the Old Testament, when, when God's people got manna? Is, is they got it new every day. They couldn't store it up. So sometimes I want to feel a certain way here before I make that call over here. Or sometimes I want to feel a certain way today before I engage this relationship two weeks from now. And here's the cool thing about future grace, is a lot of times you're not going to get it until you need it. Otherwise, you probably wouldn't be looking for Jesus, would you? You'd probably just think you had what you need, and your eyes might even go down this way. Learn to expect Jesus to show up when you need him in ways that you can't even imagine. The final two is Jesus. Jesus is a must here. Um, as, as we think about who you're waiting on, I think it's a really good question to ask yourself. Who exactly am I waiting on? I feel like I, I have waited on myself a lot of times and my own potential, my own power. The invitation this Advent season is to make sure that it's Jesus that you're waiting on. Not, not your own potential, not your own experience, not how many times you've succeeded or failed, but the invitation is to wait on Jesus, to wait on the person of Jesus, not the person of Charlie, not the person of Mike, not the person of Catherine, not to look back at your report card and think, well, I've been growing, so I think I'm probably ready now to handle this situation. You're not ready. Jesus is, and he's waiting for you there. So turn your eyes to Jesus and allow him to have a spectacular day. And it's okay to start expecting more and more and more of him. Just make sure it's him that you're waiting on and not yourself or your own performance. The last one is, is outside help. 
Outside help. You know, um, if you're going to wait on Jesus and you're going to expect him, you know what you're going to need? You're going to need to know his promises. It would be sort of like me saying, like, hey, you know, I want you guys to all expect on um, Jehoshaphat. You know, like, just put your hope in Jehoshaphat. Man, he, he's been awesome, and he's been awesome in the past, and Jeho- Jehoshaphat is where you just need to look and just find your rest. Well, that might be true, but you're like, who's Jehoshaphat? And why has he done, what kind of promises has he made? For some of you, that's like me saying, wait on Jesus. You don't know the guy. You don't know his promises. You don't know what he has to offer you. And so my encouragement is to get some outside help. Get some people who know him, who have walked with him, who understand what it is to wait and fail and then wait and succeed and then get better at wait. Get some outside help. The Holy Spirit has been given to all believers. And the Holy Spirit is your main helper. Probably on a daily basis, I have prayers that go like this. Jesus, help me. And then a few moments later, Holy Spirit, help me to trust Jesus. Like, we, we can't oftentimes muster up the faith that it's required to actually take courage and have our hearts be strengthened. But the Holy Spirit within you can. He's waiting. And oftentimes we don't have because we don't ask. So if you want to ask God for something, ask him for an increase of faith, hope, and love. Talk directly to the Holy Spirit that lives within you and say, Spirit, man, I want to wait on Jesus in this particular moment, in this particular day. You have to help me to do that. And then make sure you get people around you who can point you back to Jesus. I have a friend of mine, his name's Foy, and he has this phrase, and he he, he goes like this. Um, He feels like most people operate out of an encouragement deficit. Does that register with you? An encouragement deficit. Um, Waiting's hard. We're not naturally good at it. We have to get some outside help to encourage us along the way. I had at least two people this week, this week that I, inv- I was involved with, that I, that I was uh, in, in a connection with, where I shared um, some of, I guess you might call, like my struggle to wait, and they both pointed me back to the same thing, thankfulness. Man, why don't you walk in thankfulness in the midst of your waiting and see how that reorients your heart? Because in the midst of thankfulness, God does something. Waiting is really, really hard. I don't know what you're waiting for. I don't know how you're waiting for Jesus to show up. I don't know what promise that you're clinging to that he's maybe uh, fulfilled, but there's yet to be more fulfillment. I'm not sure what that is. But here's what I know. You will probably tap out of the line and look for your own A1A if you don't have people around you that say, hey, keep waiting, man. Keep waiting. You're doing great. I know you're struggling. Man, I know it feels like torment right now. I know all you want to do is get out of this line, turn your eyes somewhere else, and get a quick fix. But don't do it. Don't do it. Keep waiting. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. Jesus is enough. If you don't have people who will push you back into that line and keep your eyes forward, you'll probably tap. And so as we close here, we're going to have we're going to have some prayer time. I'm going to invite our prayer partners to come forward and we're just going to keep the music going and we're going to um, have opportunity for you guys to receive some prayer, to receive some encouragement. I mean, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come and, and I want you to share maybe with the people who are going to be up here. Like, I'm struggling with waiting for this, or I'm struggling with waiting for that, or I'm, man, I, 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 this is what's going on. Can you, just, can you just pray over me and into me that I would have a, a, a greater spirit of waiting on God? Because waiting is what we do. And the best thing you can do is to make this about Jesus. Check out our final slide here. Make this about Jesus. 
Psalm 27, 14. You gotta know his promises. You gotta know who he is. Wait for the Lord and be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. I love how Tim Keller writes about the resurrection. He says the resurrection of Jesus, which is now gonna be ours when Jesus comes back, is not just consolation for a rough life. It's actually renewal. It actually means that as you've walked through every pain and every suffering and everything that has caused you to question the goodness of God, Jesus will actually touch and he will give back to you in such a state for eternity that it will grant him more glory and you more joy. That's how good our God is. That's how good the gospel is. That we have a Jesus who will come and enter into the things that you've walked through and give them back to you fully renewed that you might enjoy them and he might enjoy them for eternity. He's coming to do that. Expect him to do that. And while you wait, believe that he will absolutely be enough today. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's memorize that this week and let it saturate our hearts. Stand for prayer, please. I wanna ask the God that we're waiting for and even in this moment, encourage your hearts and allow you to expect and look for and hope on him in ways that maybe you never have before that you'll walk in over the next few weeks. Father, we pray that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit, that you would give us that outside help, that you would increase our faith and our hope and our love for you, that you would give us great clarity as to what you're doing in that day, how there's nothing wasted, how there's, there's, no, there's no suffering, there's no mountain that we've walked through or that we're walking up right now in our life that is going to be just forgotten, rather that you are going to mysteriously in your goodness touch them all, renew them and give them back to us in such a way that we enjoy you because of it. God, let us believe that you are renewing all things now and one day. Help us where we're weak. Help us where we're afraid. Meet us in that moment, Father. And give us hearts that are courageous to wait on you. We trust you, Jesus, and we believe that you are going to show up even now. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We love you. Amen. You are dismissed and welcomed. Love you guys.